and Scrapworm was originally a pseudonym to um, make some sort of sense of a consciousness traversing space and time in a more universal way than just my individuated psychology, which clearly is always at work, um, but can also be applied to other um, individuals' angles of psychology and their experience, if that makes any sense. So, nebulae, light years, and memory, astro, time scales, consciousness, and thoughts. So even though I'm going at this as a way to psychologically understand our relationship to time, I also want to relate it to the speed of light, our exploration of space, and how time can be variable as related to the speed of light and different concepts um, that jump off of Einsteinian relativity and um, look at um, look through space telescopes. So, so as we consider the collective and individu individuated experience of time, first we need to talk about what is the present. We can call that now. I'm going to talk about the ideas of Julian Barber, who's um, a theorist, an astronomer, um, that puts forth a, a theory about um, every flashing now. We also have to consider what we inherit from the past, both in the biological structure of our evolved brain, and also, um, as Heidegger would put it, more in um, technocratic um, inherited or historically indebted memory structures. Um, the third thing we need to consider in this, um, since we do live in a dualized time space and we have past, present, and future, is this creative impulse to protect an imaginary idea of the future, and then in this continuum with which we find ourselves um, to enter into that and either see our visions actualized or see a difference between the visions we imagined and um, the change that resulted as these passing transformative presents occur. So those things in mind, we can, first we have to ask what does consciousness of time mean because consciousness of time itself seems a little bit self-referring. If time uh, arises from our awareness of it, then when we're conscious of it, it creates kind of a double bind. So I'll deal with that um, a little later on. And assuming that we can say that our experience of time is tied to our consciousness of it, how did our consciousness um, of time originally become conditioned and then continue as the norm, as a standardized reference point on continuity? So that ties to our social, our social norm standardizing and um, conditioning both biologically in our brains and socially as we grow up. And then this brings up the question that there is a more fluctuating sense of the present and variable passage of time, especially when um, you're in a creative flow or um, you're less aware um, of the passage of time itself, less conscious of it, but in a mode of consciousness where your task meets, uh, your skills meet your tasks, so you're not making a concerted effort. And also in psychological crisis, um, I personally find, and um, in communicating with others, that time appears variable also. So, how do we experience, um, how could the reality be experienced from um, time contingent manifestations as we observe them in the development of cities and the aging of our bodies, looking to human history, looking to deep time and geology, and looking to the light tide time of an expanding universe and astronomy and the motions of both our solar system and our Earth? Um, how does this relate to space time as a function of high energy physics? And how can it be a subtle, um, quantum dynamic on the macro and micro scale that has yet to be proven. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about mathematical science versus empirical science because empirical science is inherently self-contained in a matrix of time-space reality. So I mentioned Julian Barber before. I'm going to bring up a little video of him depending on if we have time. And you can tell me if I'm uh, sound manic and I'm going too fast, but I'm trying to pack some stuff in and also cut some stuff out. Um, so with Newton, established dynamics. He claimed that the phenomena in the universe, especially when it related to inertial motion, unfold in an infinite, invisible, and absolute space. Um, and then in the 19th century, um, uh, Ernest Mach argued that all motion is relative, and he advanced at that time the revolutionary idea that inertia does not arise from absolute space, but is a dynam dynamic effect resulting from the entire universe. And this paved the way for relativity, but, um, but there are yet some things to consider with light. So when um, Einstein contradicted Newton with the theories of general relativity and special relativity, um, establishing that space and time are linked and limited by light. Um, he asserted that gravity distorts space and time, um, but then the, a, a kind of a new thought to consider is that plasma behaviors contradict relativity and also in a way, yet mathematically um, uh, proven in, in, a, um, in a proof, um, answer inconsistencies that Einstein himself in later years acknowledged in um, his quest for a theory of everything. So um, uh, science writer Dan Falk um, gives us this four-dimensional image of space-time. If we can imagine uh, 
because largely we have uh, ingrained in our brains the construct of time um, at this time since the Copernican Re Revolution as a year is the Earth passing the sun. But if we can stretch that out instead of it's overlapping, and then we have kind of a, a funny um, 4D picture, um, uncoil these um, constant revolutions, and then we can see that if we're talking about what time as a fourth dimension could be, it could be this upward spiral on the z-axis of time. Um, but that's not how it is because it's all squished down and it seems to repeat yearly, but then there's another cycle that we have to deal with, which is a much larger cycle, and that's what I mean when I say time, astro time scales, in that um, there's also the procession of the equinoxes, which is a 26,000 year cycle that throws everything a little bit off when it comes to establishing our relationship to the celestial sphere and the red shifting galaxies as they speed away near to the speed of light. I'll get to that in a minute. I want to talk about the time that we create and we standardize, um, where it seems like we're constantly sub uh, creating intervals and subdividing them um, from the establishment of the prime meridian, as was mentioned, um, into creating a start point, breaking that into a day, breaking that into hours, minutes, seconds, nanoseconds, and having that be an unfluctuating standard that always we just say, oh, there's a little bit of margin of error. So considering that, also considering Einstein, I think we all kind of know what general relativity is, but there was a moment for me where I was like, oh my god, aha, this is why all galaxies can be um, distinct universes unto themselves because they're so far separated by the speed of light that if we considered ourselves moving away from the classic, um, classic metaphor of the clock is there, we're moving away at the speed of light. We're contained in our bubble of constant space-time, and the clock is in its um, bubble of constant space-time. So the gap between the two, time appears to stop. The clock would appear fixed. We're in our own bubble because we're at the motion of the speed of light. Yes? Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. Because the light focusing on the image of the clock is meeting our time at the rate we're moving away from it, everything is in its own, uh, we could call that dimension, reality, or time scale. And that uh, when we look to distant galaxies, they're moving away from us at near the speed of light, and that it's an astronomical um, amount of time to consider. Yeah, you guys get what I mean. Moving on. Uh, so, time is light, time is action, and in extreme theoretical motion, such as moving at the speed of light or beyond the speed of light, which, according to relativity, we know would warp our bodies, would warp everything, and is not physically possible, um, time is also relative to the observer. So, considering that, um, and getting some historical proofing on that, the Mitchelson-Morley experiment in 1881 confirmed that light could be fired in any direction with the speed state constant. Einstein's equation worked off of that. 